Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Copenhagen and welcome to the launch of DNV's Energy Transition Outlook 2022. And welcome to the many of you who are joining us uh, from all corners of the world on the live stream. We have shared with you the latest research into the Energy Transition Outlook every autumn since 2017. The dramatic events since February this year, heightened focus on energy security, sky-high energy prices and inflation is putting us into a different situation for our discussions today. Earlier this year, a few weeks after the war started, we already ran our energy transition model to understand the impact of the war on the energy transition. You will have, que you will have questions related to the short-term outlook, but also to the long-term outlook. And we will share both of them with you and discuss these. Today we will hear from DNV's group president and CEO. We are also joined by Minister of Petroleum and Energy of Norway. And I'm looking forward to a panel discussion on how the current energy security and macroeconomic developments are affecting the speed of the transition with executives from Vestas, Total Energies and Arca Asset Management. In the second panel, we will look to Denmark as a showcase for turning talk into extraordinary action. We will get Örstedt's and EnergyNet's insights on Denmark's newly announced ambitious offshore wind plants and on how new energy islands will accelerate power to x plans. We will also hear from the chairman of the Danish Council on Climate Change. And we will round up our session having a look at Schammelscheich and COP25, uh, 27, sorry, we are 27 already, <laughs> uh, and talk to UNCC's high-level champion for Egypt. But it is now my pleasure to introduce you to DNV's group president and so CEO, Remy Eriksson, who will give us the latest insights into the report published 2022. Welcome, Remy. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of DNV's Energy Transition Outlook. And this is the 2022 edition. Firstly, let me say how pleased I am to be able to launch this in Copenhagen. Denmark and Danish companies are frontrunners in clean technology solutions. Denmark also has a unique national governance model and uh, they have set ambitious targets, but more importantly, followed up with bold action. Illustrated by the recent Danish-led initiative to boost offshore wind capacity to 380 gigawatts by 2030, and by building dedicated energy islands to scale power to X. Let me start with the main conclusion. Our forecast is that the world is far from securing net zero emissions by 2050, and we are on the way to 2.2 degrees of global warming by the end of this century compared to pre-industrial levels. Our outlook is a forecast, not a scenario. It represents our view of the most likely development of the energy system through to 2050, through the lenses of world regions, 10 of them, and global sectors. If ever, ever there was a year when the energy trilemma felt most pressing, it must be this year. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has underlined how vulnerable energy security is in Europe, clearly, but elsewhere, too. Cyber attacks and the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines are brutal reminders of how energy can be weaponized and of the urgency of moving to a much more secure and localized, and with that I mean more renewables-based energy system. For the affordability point of view, I think we all are concerned about the impact of high gas and electricity prices for households and businesses upending markets worldwide. However, long term of a forecast sees household energy expenses reducing considerably per kilowatt hours as the whole energy system long term becomes more efficient owing to electricity and electrification. And on sustainability, COP26 and uh, recent IPCC reports stress that the climate crisis is code red 
for humanity, no less. The floods in Pakistan and also recently in Florida are impacting millions of families and are tragic reminders of the consequences of climate changing emissions, most of them energy related. It's not easy to see beyond the present crash of crisis, to see what the future holds for our energy future. But that is exactly what our energy forecasting team has done. And perhaps surprisingly, we find that for the first time, first time in our forecasting, non-fossil fuel sources edge slightly ahead of fossil sources in the 2050 energy mix. In fact, if you subtract fossil sources that is not used for energy purposes, such as petrochemical products and asphalt, we move this share up to 54%. On the face of it, that is good news indeed, and it implies a very large shift from the 80-20 split that we have today, and that is happening in the just the space of one generation, 28 years. But it is far from zero. Our analysis shows that while Europe is taking a step back now for the couple, next couple of years by opening for more coal use, Europe will take two steps forward under Repower EU to accelerate the build out of renewables, to boost efficiency, and to secure more energy independence. Elsewhere in the world, and part particularly for low income countries, high energy and food prices are reversing the coal to gas switch and putting a dampening on decarbonisation investments. Also, supply chain challenges and commodity cost increases are challenging clean tech industries. For example, compared to last year, we find that the year in which electrical vehicles will be 50% of all uh, new car sales is delayed by one year to 2033. But overall, the short-term issues are minor compared to the three big forces of the transition, which is one, the decreasing cost of renewables, second, electrification, which makes more things much more efficient, and the thirdly, rising carbon prices. The standout feature of the energy transition is without doubt, as I mentioned, electrification, which more than doubles over the next three decades, more importantly, electricity is greening at the same time. Our forecast is that wind and solar PV will uh, grow significantly. Wind will grow tenfold and solar PV 20-fold and together supply 70% of uh, electricity in 2050. If you add to this hydropower and nuclear, the non-fossil share of electricity is 88% in 2050. This has an important decarbonization effect, obviously, but it also leads to accelerating efficiencies in our energy system. In fact, those efficiency gains will outstrip global economic growth with the effect that by mid-century the world will spend, be spending a lower share of GDP on energy. DNV has pointed out this green price phenomenon consistently for the past five years, and it's gratifying that our work has recently been independently confirmed by researchers at Oxford Industries Martin School, who also find that expansion of renewables and electrification liberates trillions of dollars in savings, before factoring in the cost of climate change and the co-benefit of climate policies like cleaner air. Although the energy transition falls very short of the Paris Agreement goals, our forecast points to very large opportunities for the ones that are in the energy industry. Our analysis shows that renewable expenditures are expected to double over the next 10 years to more than $1,300 billion per year by 2030. On top of this comes investments in, in, um, in uh, grids, which will exceed 1,000 billion US dollars per year by 2032. On top of this comes the investments in carbon capture and storage, in hydrogen, and also in synthetic fuels. 
even though we are moving, <coughs> excuse me, to a more uh, economically efficient energy system, not everything will be cheap, and this applies particularly to the emerging hydrogen ecosystem. In our hydrogen forecast that we launched in June this year, I reminded everybody that despite the tremendous attention currently on hydrogen, high costs for both blue and green hydrogen sees the use of hydrogen for energy purposes only scaling with impact in the 2030s. And by 2050, we will meet just 5% of world energy demand by hydrogen, with about 10% of demand in Europe. Because of low and zero carbon hydrogen is so critical for tackling the hard to abate and hard to electrify sectors, like aviation, like shipping, and industrial processes requiring high heating. We see that in a net zero future, hydrogen should be closer to 15% of the demand rather than 5%, while for Europe it should be as much as 25% of the demand by 2050. This is a good time for me to point out also that in fact, with this year's energy transition outlook, we include our net zero pathway. We think it is very useful to compare what we consider to be the most likely future, which is more 50-50, to what it will take to deliver a net zero pathway by 2050. The gap, as you understand, is very large. And you remember the most likely future shows 50% uh, of the energy mix with fossil fuels in 2050. In a net zero future, that needs to drop to 20% or 25%. We believe it's infeasible to completely wean the world off fossil fuels in just a matter of three decades. That means that enormous investment will be needed in carbon capture and removal and in reversing land use, for example, from defore deforestation to afforestation. By the 2040s, carbon removal will require expenditure running to $1,000 billion annually to secure a net zero by 2050. A further hard reality is that for the world to get net zero, high-income countries, roughly speaking, the OECD countries, are going to go below zero, in other words, become net negative, taking more out of the atmosphere than putting into it well before 2050. China will need to bring its net zero year forward to, from 2060 to 2050, and China needs to bring it from 2070 to 2060. So 10 years closer for most climate emissions. The low-income regions, for example, and regions such as uh, sub-Saharan Africa will not be able to do it before 2050, but will need to do so by the end of this century. For our part, I can assure you that DNV will be doing everything we can to work with our customers in their ambitions to transition faster. I'm looking forward to the discussions we will have this morning, and uh, we will be inspired by the Norway's Minister for Petroleum and Energy, Tari Oslan, and also by senior executives from the energy industry, and I'm particularly looking forward to uh, our Danish friends that will be discussing how Denmark is taking the lead on accelerating the energy transition. Thank you. The Energy Trilemma has been brought into sharp focus. Achieving an energy system that is secure, affordable and sustainable has never seemed more important or more complicated. Households around the world are struggling with high energy prices. So how affordable is reaching net zero by 2050? Whole regions are reshaping their energy policy as they prioritize energy independence. But does that come at the expense of decarbonization? Supply chains remain squeezed. Does that make the case for renewables more difficult? Meeting the challenges of the energy trilemma requires key players in technology, finance and policy to work together.
So, in our first panel, we would like to discuss the energy trilemma of energy security, affordability, and climate targets. We are joined by Henrik Andersen, Group President and CEO of Vestas. Welcome. Uh, you're a global leader in sustainability, the sustainable energy solutions with a focus on wind. A warm welcome also to Helle Christoffersen, President for Strategy and Sustainability at Total Energies. Total Energies is turning into a broader energy company that produces market fuels, natural gas and electricity in more than 130 countries. Welcome. And I would also like to welcome Yngwie Schlingster, CEO of Arca Asset Management, responsible for building and developing active asset management. This will include funds dedicated to infrastructure and the energy transition. Yngwie, you may be most uh, known for being the former CEO of the Norwegian Oil Fund or Sovereign Wealth Fund. Welcome. <laughs> the past couple of years have seen more turbulence in the markets and the energy trilemma in 2022 is more pressing than what we have seen in the past, as Remy mentioned in his introduction. We've experienced the demand shock of the pandemic and the supply shock of that came with the invasion uh, into U the Ukraine. I've got a first question for Henrik. Uh, for years, there's been big focus on lowering costs of energy. Now the geopolitical uncertainties are dominating the agenda. How do you see the situation impacting the energy market seen from the perspective of a solutions provider? I think you should be fine. Thanks, uh, Henrike. Thank, for, thank you for having us here. Um, and I think here, um, I'm probably the one that will be a, a little bit more leaning away from the wishful thinking, uh, Remy, on, on some of the things. Because if we look at it, facts is today that over the last 10 years, renewable solutions have lowered levelized cost of energy to something where it's the lowest compared to any other energy source. So we find there that we can build wind, solar, and others in competition with gas, oil, and, and definitely nuclear. Um, so I think that's first fact. The other fact, of course, is when we look at it right now, um, it's a fossil crisis. It's a fossil fuel crisis. Uh, and therefore, the build out to compensate can only happen through the renewable. And the third fact, and I have to say, I wish the 51% in 2050 <laughs> will come through. Because if you took actual, actual decision making, in the political arena, then probably we are left with something that maybe not even get to half of that. Let's not forget EU in 21 had 31 gigawatt of plan and target, and we realized 17. That's not half good. That's incredible poor. And what we actually need is the 2080, right? The 80 for, uh, renewables and the 20 fossil fuels. Yeah, and we, and we have to ask ourselves, and I like your triangle, because how is it we have set up our permitting structure today, and does it actually accelerate on the given circumstances that we have right now? And it doesn't. Yeah. We have, in reality, most part of Europe and the rest of the world delegated the permitting to municipalities, which means in the current climate, we have delegated our defense policy to our municipalities, and we shouldn't do that. Thank you, Henrik. Let's move to Helle and to Tal Energies. How are broader energy companies addressing the energy trilemma of having to ensure energy security in Europe, rising energy prices, but at the same time not losing focus on the climate targets? Yes, good morning, everyone. And so, um, Good question, and of course, uh, Remy is right, and the outlook is right. We cannot afford to lose focus uh, with respect to climate change. And at the same time, people need energy here and now, uh, affordable and uh, secure energy, and hence, I would say, the tension. Um, I think if we step back, what we see is that we still need the old system, like it or not, because it does power the world today, households and, in and industries. So. We're finding ourselves in a need to effectively invest in two systems at the same time. The old one support it for what it's worth and because it's still powering the world and of course accelerating the transition towards a green energy system. And this dual investment of course requires strong companies who have the financial strength to do so 
And if I make a long story short, this is our strategy at Total Energies. We are investing, uh, we hope wisely, in today's energies to avoid stranded assets, so low cost, uh, low emission oil and gas, and we are accelerating our investments in green energies for tomorrow, not just renewables, also new molecules, hydrogen, we'll talk about that, biofuels, biogas, and so on, and also energy efficiency, which is an important element of the equation that hasn't been mentioned so far, but I'm sure we're gonna talk about it. Very short term, we're trying to address the uh, uh, all the governments in Europe that are asking us to speed up, do more in traditional energies, uh, gas in particular here in Denmark, we've been able to uh, increase our gas production by 10%, but indeed mm -hmm. across the board, we're being asked to do everything we can to provide short-term security and affordability. Thank you. Uh, we'll get back to kind of the duality. Uh, we, you as Total Energy, of course, have the the, the, the good position of uh, having that equity running in <laughs> in order to invest in, in, in um, renewables. Uh, I think Henrik doesn't, uh, doesn't have that income stream. But let's get back to that. Uh, I'm curious about that. But first, let's uh, welcome Ingwe as well. Uh, Ingwe, uh, from your perspective as an investor, how do you see the risk for the various assets in different energy sectors and geographies has changed over the last year? And, and ha kind of how has the last 12 months shaped your approach uh, to investment and to risk? Yeah, what a uh, very significant last 12 months has yes. been. Um, incredible developments. I think the first thing with the energy transition is that it's not, even though it's necessary, it's not shielded from the wider developments in, uh, in the markets and the economies. And what we have seen, of course, is um, significant development on the macro space, uh, inflation, cost inflation, investors who know all about this. Uh, we've had, of course, inflation coming, changes in real rates is coming there. Energy is long dated assets, so particularly vulnerable to, to that. We have changes in the demand supply. Energy assets is very exposed to those demand supply shocks, so we have that coming also. So I think generally you see a higher risk in the total way that we put together our economies, uh, and uh, energy is probably as much exposed to that as anything. Europe, of course, very special case. Um, very challenging, incredibly challenging. What is happening in Europe is also influencing the rest of the world with regards to LNG pricing, etc. Mm. And so I think we just have to be prepared for that. This was very difficult last 12 months, but it's not necessary such that these difficulties are easily solved or will go away. So it's a long-term challenging problem. So you haven't changed your investment strategy? No, I think it's uh, it's fair to say that uh, that uh, wind and solar long-term looks even more attractive. Uh, but we cannot sit and say we're going to build first stop with something oil and gas and then we're going to build something off switch. Mm -hmm. We have to keep going with what right. we have as the energy system as yeah. the total energy says there. And then we have to build as fast as possible what we can have to replace it at a yeah. later stage. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good. Henrik, uh, supply chains, also a, a big topic. We've noted in our report this year uh, that stretched supply chains are having an impact on the energy transition. And we're seeing a massive scaling of the wind, wind energy, of course. What are the pain points in your supply chain? Uh, there are multiple. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, probably the world has decided to come uh, almost to a perfect storm uh, from being moving to through a COVID, which has all its various lockdowns and opportunities to close harbors and, and other things, which basically to come out and suddenly have a demand cycle that probably ran ahead of the supply cycle, yeah. which led to a vacuum in a lot of components, a lot of raw materials, combined with you still had multiple challenges around transport and logistics. So that's one. But I also then will draw back to, to your point, Ingrid, which is fantastic. This is a bump on a probably 20, 30, 40 years energy transition uh, journey. And I think it's important that we overcome that. We are an industry where we have to get used to that we hold a valuable asset and we have to charge the customer that price for that asset. Not necessarily back in time trying to price it with old cost, but actually what kind of valuation and value does it, it create? And let me just give again a few facts because I want to address Ramis, cheap energy or cheap electricity. UK said the same in the CFD round four, 37 and a half pound per megawatt hour in the recent one. At the same time, merchant market on that day were 400 pound per megawatt hour. And you can build new wind at 37, you bring nuclear on when Hinkley for once is ready 
around 200 pounds per megawatt hour. So why are we questioning the whole quest to get almost to zero rather than build out much more gigawatt at not 37 and a half, but maybe at 50, as a clever government would do, it's still one eighth of the current market pricing. So the only way to compensate and look to the consumer is to build more at competitive, competitive rates. So therefore, I can sit here and complain about my supply chain. The truth of it is that supply chain is part of actually the solution to drive down electricity costs again. So we are ready to do that. <laughs> Very good. And in, in our outlook, it shows that the long-term trends for the energy transition remain with rapid rise of renewables and growing electrification outweighing the sh short-term shocks that we see. But while we need more investments in renewables to speed up the energy transition, it is those companies that are part of the fossil fuel business that are experiencing the highest revenues. So getting back to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry about that, Hella. <laughs> But uh, so, so, so to you, energy majors like Total have seen those profits. But um, what will the long term look for you? Like uh, you mentioned already that, of course, it needs to be part of the equation. But does more decarbonization mean then less returns on investment for the shareholders? So how do we incentivize companies like Total to decarbonize even quicker? Yeah, uh, all good comments and questions. <laughs> Let me just say that if prices have gone up in fossil fuels, it's because we have collectively been underinvesting. In part, maybe for lack of good enough projects. I don't know. We can talk about that. But certainly, in part, because of ESG um, investor pressure and maybe regulation. So it's back to the first comment. Demand doesn't change overnight, and we still need to support the existing uh, energy system. And if we underinvest in oil, for instance, and oil demand is still high, then what happens? The price adjusts upward. Okay, so this is a this is a reality of of, of, of the business. Now. Um, we have effectively decided that we are going to use our financial strength to accelerate our transition and transformation into a multi-energy company. And so we announced a couple of weeks ago a new capital budget. First, we announced a bigger pie. We are going to invest more as an energy, multi-energy company, uh, between 14 and 18 billion dollars per year, which of course is massive because this is equity money that is being thrown into uh, the energy markets. And then in this larger pie, it used to be 13 to 16 billion, we are going to dedicate a bigger share to energy transition businesses. Uh, we said 25% in the past, now it's going to be one third. So it is effectively one third of a bigger pie, so we are accelerating. And if we do that, it's because we concur with the need to decarbonize. It's because we see great opportunities also in uh, clean and green power, uh, and also over time in the new molecules. So we're certainly not spending more money on the transition to make lower returns. <laughs> yes. We want to keep high Your shareholders will accept that. Yes, well, for, you know, we... we we spoke about our strategy at the AGM back in May. We asked our shareholders to uh, express a vote on our strategy, and we got close to 90% buy-in. So for the time being, uh, you know, our shareholders are certainly following what we're doing. And we think it's very important. We're also helping our customers decarbonize and dedicate specialized teams to that. So, yeah. so we already do a lot. Yeah. Thank you. In, the, uh, in relation to that, have you then seen, because you promised when you came into the position a few months ago uh, to invest in green projects, but have you seen like a, that, that there's less hunger for investing in green projects because of lower return on investments? Or kind of investors need to have kind of a long, long view? Yeah, no, I think yeah, absolutely opposite. Uh, investors are really interested in uh, this area and uh, what is offered there. And uh, I think it's a different equation that's coming in. Before you sort of a few years ago, looking at not so much development construction risk, but a lot more electricity price risk. Now it's more balanced. Uh, I think we can anchor the view on long-term electricity prices more with regards to long-term LNG fixed price contracts that's coming. So I think that's quite quite important. I think also the report is very good in highlighting that there's a big trend here with regards to electrification, right? And that electrification is super important because it actually reduces the energy inefficiency. The way we are using energy is much more efficient in a more electrified world. And that goes along with two other maybe very large trends, urbanization and digitalization. So I think that whole area is very clear for investors that you like to get into this area with regards to not thinking about 
the commodity aspect of electricity, but what does it actually do for the economy and what does it do for profit margins, et cetera, et cetera. So I think actually generally the bigger investors with a longer horizon are getting more positive for investment into this space. That's good. That's good for, for Henrik, right? <laughs> we talked a little bit actually in, in our, our pre-chat about um, uh, you know, what the wind sector needs to do and that there's you know, new developments all the time and bigger than the Eiffel Tower and so on. But uh, you want more scaling. What, what kind of, how can the industry kind of now focus on scaling? First of all, if you want to be sustainable, you have to build a sustainable uh, financial model on a company as, as well, and that goes for a company and as an industry. And I think there we have to, to look inside. I 100% I agree, and if I look to, especially my right here, there's a lot of capital that wants to, uh, <laughs> to find a new home. And I think we can, we can find some of those projects that are in the current circumstances have never been more uh, attractive, so to say. Because one thing is you can help the consumer and the other thing is, of course, you can, you can help it by putting something in place that lasts for, for 30 years. Um, but, but, but looking at it, I will also say it, it has to happen from a company perspective. And I will be very nervous for if the industry continue to actually defocus away from what is the price of a solution put up for 30 years and why are we not putting that at a price where it's easy to afford. Latest customer conversation said, oh, could I get a turbine to old price? I said, of course you can. If I can have your electricity offtake price, then I'm perfectly happy to switch. <laughs> and you can all guess, even in the room here, what the answer was. No, 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 actually, actually I would rather buy uh, the turbine for a higher price. So right now, I think we owe to our generation. I have two daughters, 20 and 23 years old. They won't forgive me in 10 years' time if we don't get much more forward and much more accelerated in this. So I think we have to get the energy transition under a leadership and management, but we also have to start applying it a bit more aggressively. Yeah. Thank you. And, and we will hear later from one of the key officials from COP27, as mentioned, the energy transition outlook forecast. We are missing the Paris target by a large margin, and we need more of everything, renewables, CCS, and hydrogen. And there a question for Hella: Why are hydrogen and CCS lagging so far behind from where they need to be? So do you agree with the, the report and the numbers as presented? Is it just a case of carbon pricing that needs to increase? Yeah, I would say by and large, uh, from Remy's uh, summary, we, we kind of share the same view. Uh, hydrogen is a fantastic molecule, but it's not ready for prime time quite now. Uh, in the years of 230s and beyond, as, as Remy said, that's our same analysis. And the reason is, of course, if you put a price on carbon, it helps. It helps all the business cases of the new stuff. Uh, there's a social acceptance uh, issue with high carbon prices. There are countries that will never do it, the US probably. Uh, but that helps, it's not enough. So hydrogen, fantastic, but still very costly. The production for green hydrogen, the, the process is highly inefficient, so it's, it's too costly. Technology needs to improve and it needs to scale. We also share the view that CCS is absolutely required uh, to get to net zero, net uh, carbon emissions. IPCC, you know, their report over the summer said the same, so I think there's a large consensus on that now, which is good. Uh, we are involved in that market, both in Norway and here in Denmark. We've applied for a storage license, so absolutely, absolutely key. And uh, the North Sea is a great place for CCS. Uh, but then again, it's not just about putting a price on carbon or wanting to do it. If you think about it, CCS is the same as dumping waste somewhere. And therefore, if you cannot use CO2, it's waste. Therefore, you need to be sure that the reservoirs or the storage, if it's a, a saline aquifer, wherever, it has to be, you know, safe. It has to be long-lasting. You have to worry about liabilities. You have to worry about uh, protocols to uh, transport waste from one country to another. You probably need dedicated infrastructure. So there are many challenges ahead, but again, we're very... Uh, uh, optimistic uh, about the opportunity, and we certainly believe we need it. So uh, let's go for it, and uh, Total Energies, <laughs> you can count us in on that, for sure, including here in the North Sea. That's great to hear, and I guess Norway has uh, something to offer there as well, with more than 25 years of experience on CCS, and uh, yeah, a lot of space under the seabed to, to, uh, for, for, for CO2. Um, 
I was going to ask Ingwer, is ARC asset management kind of this, do you have projects, investments in CCS and hydrogen? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, you know, uh, the only pure play listed company on uh, carbon capture is ARC Carbon Capture, uh, the only one in the world as far as I know. So this is an area that we certainly are going into and think can be interesting. Also for the much bigger projects where we get institutional investors aligned to it. Um, you know, I'm actually with uh, Hendrik here, uh, two daughters the same age, who would not forgive me if we were able to, able to get all of this money going into this space because this is kind of a necessity. It is the investment challenge of a generation. You know, we are talking about uh, 2% of GDP going to maybe 4% of GDP was going there. And there's no way to do this without getting institutional investors aligned. Because in the final end, uh, who's going to sit on all these assets on the balance sheet? If it's not government, which I think is unlikely, even corporate balance sheet is not big enough. This is very long dated assets. It's going to be low yielding, hopefully a bit more stable in returns than what you have now. Uh, and the logic of that is uh, pension funds and similar uh, entities will be sitting on a large part of this. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really the challenge that we're trying to line up for in uh, Yeah, Very good. To all of you, to round up a bit, to give an opportunity also for, for a final statement, are you more or less optimistic than DNV is, <laughs> which says that we're heading towards a 2.2 future by the end of the century? Uh, I'm more negative on it. I think uh, mathematically you can all do the calculations, but I think if you look behind what happens this year, we'll be further away, which means that year we have to catch up in a shorter time period. So I'm, we can all do the math but it doesn't stack up, unfortunately. Are you an optimistic person? I'm a very optimistic <laughs> person. Otherwise, otherwise, I'm pretty sure my wife would have said I wouldn't have been able to be with her for 40 years. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting up every yeah. day and believing yeah. something better today. Yeah. Um, but I'm also the one that said uh, I've been long enough and follow business enough that that dream time doesn't work when you sit here. And I think we spent far too much time in trying to redo history rather than actually do the future and I think the future right now deserves that we do active decision making rather than arguing of the past. Mm. Yes we'll get back to the uh, case on Denmark because I mean Denmark is a great uh, uh, Let me just say right? here we yeah. are a great example <laughs> again declaring pledges doesn't solve CO2 doesn't solve supply and so far in the energy island the only thing that has happened is a delay of three years. Mm. That is not able to count electricity into the supply, please. Yeah. So I see our next panel is getting really nervous. They want to join <laughs> us right away. So I let's would, let's. I would love to sit <laughs> and ask there. about it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, okay. what about you? Are so you optimistic? I, I, I have two yeah. comments because my yeah. children are going to be upset if I don't mention them. <laughs> so I have a daughter and a son of the same age as yours, oh, but right. I do have a son, and we. Enough, that's for sure. Let me just mention something that we want to think is extremely important and we'll probably hear about it too. But if we want to speed up everything, let's just not talk about the richer countries. Let's also talk about the rest of the world and about the Copenhagen Pledge and the 100 billion that were supposed to be funded by the richer countries to the developing markets as of 2020. We are nowhere close. And if you step back and you think about how can you best invest your money as a government or maybe as pension fund and institutional investors, then helping the developing world get on the right trajectory and not using domestic coal or uh, biomass, traditional biomass, uh, burning wood and waste, which is both bad for environment and health, air quality, and for biodiversity. So I would say uh, let's also put our act together in the rest of the world as beautiful and lovely as the Dan Danish plans are, they will not put everybody on the right track either. So it's, it's almost just preparing for the next panel. <laughs> it's almost a great final word. I want to give Ingwe also the opportunity <laughs> to say something. Yeah, I, you know, um, I speak to a lot of people in the industry and uh, everybody realizes that we have to kind of, you know, stop talking and start doing stuff. And that means building. Everyone who's building like uh, Henrik and Helle, they will say the same thing. This is not realistic. The scenarios is coming up. We are way, way short of it. Uh, of course, something may change, but, uh, um, but it is challenging even to get to the numbers that uh, this DNV report is uh, giving us. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, now we're turning from the private sector perspective to the gov governmental perspective. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Norwegian Minister of Petroleum and Energy, Teddy Osland. Let us start with a short video. 
With energy security and high prices dominating the near-term agenda, the task of policymakers has become even more complex. The COP conferences started in the 1990s to combat climate change, but have so far failed to deliver meaningful action. Will COP27 be any different? Massive policy intervention is possible. Huge rescue packages were implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it was the fossil fuels industry that benefited most from these measures. Only 6% went to greening the energy systems or carbon emissions reduction. The technology exists to meet the challenges of the energy trilemma, but it needs to be matched by policy. How does today's energy reality inform tomorrow's policy? the most important outlook so far. In a time with international tensions, I'm so glad to be in Copenhagen today to celebrate international cooperation and the relations between close energy partners. This is much needed to address the challenges ahead. And in a time with unstable energy markets, significant changes are happening from week to week, even from day to day. In this changing uh, landscape, the outlook provides a useful tool for industries, business, and not least politicians. And though there are many parts, we can all agree on the destination. The world needs more energy. It needs cleaner energy. It needs reliable energy supplies, and we need to find solutions across borders. Because what is perhaps the main point of the outlook, high energy prices and greater focus on energy securities due to the war in Ukraine will not slow the long-term transition. So how will today's energy reality, reality inform tomorrow's policy as we plan and act for the short and long term? Whether well, it's it's renewables, where our main focus on the short term is to assist households and industries to deal with shoring energy prices. In the longer run, we must facilitate for increased renewable production, strengthening the power grid and change energy efficiency. In Oil and gas will continue to play a role in the energy mix after 2050. And we know the crucial role it plays in Europe today. Norway will remain a stable and predictable supplier of oil and gas through the energy transition. And we will continue to ensure decreasing emissions from the petroleum production. And not to forget, offshore competence and know-how from the oil and gas sector will contribute on our pathway to net zero, such as for CCS. We have stored CO2 under the seabed in Norway for more than 25 years. We know it works. We know it's safe. The Norwegian government is firmly committed to develop a robust value chain for CCS in Norway and hopefully abroad. Or hydrogen, where the energy outlook calls for increased efforts. Norway is well positioned for taking part in establishing hydrogen value chains with or high renewable share in the electricity mix and the production of natural gas close to the European market. And not least, we are now turning visions into practice on offshore wind by launching our, our ambitions to award areas for, by 2040 for production of 30 gigawatts offshore wind. Dear friends, energy markets are changing, technologies are changing, climate is changing. This is not the time for fixed energy policies as we plan for the present and future. So again, 
Thank you for the presentation. The energy transition outlook improves the map of a changing terrain. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Oslan. I've got a couple of questions for you. So what do you consider to be Norway's most important contribu contribution to speed up the climate change mitigation? When I heard the last uh, debate on the panel, I think I will be more aggressive in the future. Okay, than yeah. In the past. <laughs> I think that uh, reminds us that uh, we are in a moment and we have to, to, to make it think happen uh, rather faster in the future than we have done in the past. And from the Norway perspective, we have a good competence in uh, important areas, such as electrification. The Norwegian society is highly electrified. We have competence in that field. Carbon capture and storage will be important, especially in the hard to abate uh, sector. And we have the floating offshore wind with the potential that we have no announced at 30 gigawatts. Perhaps we have a lot more. And the hydrogen. We have a long experience to develop hydrogen electrolyzers. Uh, and uh, we see the industry in Norway taking part of the hydrogen uh, adventure in the future. Yara is a good example for, for that. So I think we have a lot of uh, opportunities. We can contribute, but we have to play together with the industry. Because as politicians, we can make a framework and we can be making a playing field, but uh, the industry have to play. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think you've answered both of my questions. <laughs> Thank you. I promised you during my introduction that we would take a closer look at Denmark uh, as a showcase for turning talk into extraordinary action. Denmark combines ambitious climate targets with novel technology, regulatory frameworks, and governance. For that, I'm handing over to DNV's CEO for Energy Systems, Ditlev Engel, who will introduce you to his panelists. Denmark recognized the potential of renewables earlier than almost any other country. And by taking unrivaled action to harness the potential of wind, it is well placed to meet the challenges of the energy trilemma. Already today, Domestic wind production accounts for more than half of Denmark's electricity consumption. Now, Denmark is building the world's first energy island. A North Sea hub will initially provide 3 gigawatts of energy and could eventually provide enough energy to power 10 million homes. Another project in the Baltic Sea will provide enough energy for 2 million homes. Both islands will produce excess energy, which can be used to make green hydrogen. The ambitions go way beyond the Danish borders. In May, the EU president and heads of state from Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany met in the Danish town of Esbjerg and committed to jointly building 150 gigawatts of offshore wind energy in the North Sea by 2050. In comparison, Europe's total on and offshore wind energy production is 190 gigawatts today. Also, in September, the leaders of eight Baltic nations travelled to Denmark to sign a treaty to increase offshore wind capacity sevenfold to almost 20 gigawatts by 2030 in the region. So, welcome to the second panel. I'm very happy to introduce my three panelists here. We have uh, Peter Mulgaard, who is the chair of the Danish Council on Climate Change. We have Hannes Storm Edlusen, who is VP from the TSO Energy System and responsible for Energy Islands. And we have Martin Neubert, who is the deputy CEO and CCO of Öster. Now, as Ulrike mentioned in her opening, we would like to focus on what we decided to call Danish doers. And as what you could see in the trilemma, it is not just about uh, one item, it's about three items that have to go hand in hand. So the first point I'd like to focus on is on the regulation and the policy side. And I don't think that everybody who's watching today knows exactly what is the Danish Council on Climate Change. 
and what is the purpose of it? So maybe, Peter, if you can start to introduce to everybody, what are you actually doing? Thank you, Nidlo. <laughs> uh, what are we actually doing? Uh, I, I, can I just say that I love the title of this panel. It's uh, Turning Talk into Action. Yes. I think that's a raison d'etre uh, <laughs> of the Danish Council on Climate Change. Uh, as a catalyst, we, we, we aim to do that. So, so perfect uh, title of, of, of the panel. And what we do, we have a long history, but what is important, I think, and exemplary in Denmark, is that we have a, a um, climate act uh, of 2020, so it's a little more than two years old, that establishes uh, what the role of the climate uh, council is. And we have three roles. I'm going to talk mostly of one. Uh, the first role is as an advisor on climate policy to the government and parliament. The second is uh, to partake in, uh, in public debate, such as I do now. And the third, and that's one I'm going to talk about, is the watchdog role. And we have, we have in the Danish Climate Act a, a role as a watchdog for, for climate policy. Something could be copied in, uh, in Norway, for example. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and the role is that we, uh, maybe first, is, you, you mentioned that we have very ambitious climate targets in Denmark. That's true. We have uh, 50 to 54% uh, reduction in 2025. 20, compared with 1990, 70% uh, compared uh, in 2030 compared with uh, 1990 and climate neutrality at the latest in 2050. Now, what we do is to say, yeah, talk is cheap, so we want to see action. So that's why I like uh, this. And what we can do in the Danish uh, Council on Climate Change is to, um, a little bit like an auditor, uh, to monitor the progress of climate policy, of government's policy, and see, okay, how concrete is it? And the more concrete it is, the more we count it towards fulfilling those climate targets. So that's one aspect, and I think we have a lot of commonality. <laughs> Congratulations, by the way, with, uh, with the ETO. Thank you. Um, we, we, in, in our, what we do in our uh, annual report, this is the one, uh, this is from February this year, what we do is to assess government's progress um, uh, in, in terms of delivering actual policy that can actually lead to uh, reductions in emissions in 2025, in 2030, and in the long run. So the more it becomes a political agreement, and ideally with a broad uh, majority behind it, the more we count the uh, actions. The other aspect that we have, and which is also similar to what you do, is we count the risk. We try to say how risky is it. And I have a few examples. Maybe I, I should hold them a little bit. Can I just say one more thing? You can. And that is that if we we have in this report, we have twice now told the Danish government we we think you're on track, but you are not. You're not yet made li made likely that you can achieve the ambitious Danish climate targets. And then in principle, and that's unique in Denmark, I think, and, and a very good role, uh, parliament can, can say, okay, then please, please government, you have to act. So there's a duty to act embedded in the Danish Climate Act. And I think that is a unique government or uh, governance structure in Denmark, which is pushing climate policies to become more action and less talk. Good, we'll come back to that a little later. Thank you, uh, Peter. Now, Hannah. Energy islands, and, and I think first thing people watching this will say, what is an energy island and, and why do we need it? So maybe if you can just tell people what is an energy island. Thank you, Dietlev. <laughs> so first, no man is an island. These words from the famous poet John Donne is one of the two things that I've brought with me today. The other thing is this, it's a piece of cable that usually lies on the seabed. And what does those two things have to do with each other? An ancient poem from the 17th century and this modern HVDC cable. Well, that is the core of the energy island because no man is an island. Nobody stands on its own. No country stands on its own. We have to interconnect with each other and here the cable is the key. You saw it in the movie before, but the basic idea about energy islands is that you far out at sea, where the wind resources are fantastic, you sort of create a nearshore environment by uh, building a sort of 
artificial island or platforms or whatever. And then you put up massive amounts of wind farms and connect them by relatively short cables to the island. And then you use this and you connect that to several countries and you use the seabed cables to both import and export and hence uh, make sure that you have uh, stable prices and uh, high security of supply across borders. So that's the key concept of the energy islands. And the point is that we need way more energy, renewable, and we need to share it because not everybody has these vast amounts of wind resources uh, close to them. And we also need to connect because then we can connect across consumption and production patterns. So the key is that no man is an island. We need to stand together and we need to develop these things together in the sector. It's massive, it's huge projects. And uh, not only me, but a lot of others in Denmark are working on this. And uh, you can be sort of quite paralyzed about the complexity of these huge projects. But the point is that we need to be bold. And I think that the Danish politicians and the supporting industry has already been bold in sort of setting in place and deciding that we should have these two first energy islands. And we are doing the innovation on the way while we are planning and building. And there are a lot of international eyes on us. But the really important thing is actually not those two first islands, but the innovation that will come out of them and that will spread to the west of the world, not only to the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, but also to other seas, making sure that no man is an island, that we connect to each other and that we share the green energy for a safer future. Thank you, uh, Anna. Now we talk about the transition, and uh, if there's a company that has transitioned a lot, then it's Öster. And for those who doesn't know, then many years ago, it was a lot of small different Danish companies that was decided to be added together to one, which then became Dong, which then became Öster. And Martin, uh, you've been with Öster for, for 15 years. If you could try to explain to people the journey you were on as an organization, and where do you think you would have been today if you hadn't become the world leader in offshore wind? Yeah, no, happy, happy to uh, uh, did you. Uh, so uh, in 2008, we were Dong Energy, and for the audience, Dong standing for Danish oil and natural gas. Uh, we were one of the largest emitters of CO2 in Europe, uh, running on uh, uh, coal-fired power generation and on oil and gas exploration. Um, and you could ask from today's perspective, would that not be a good place to be? <laughs> and I, I, I just can tell you, sort of, even thinking about the scenario, and I know it's hypothetical, uh, it, it causes me physical pain. Um, because no, uh, it would not be. Um, I think if we would have sort of held it on uh, to where we were in 2008, um, uh, it would have meant uh, the world would have been short of uh, 10 gigawatt of offshore wind. Uh, offshore wind uh, was described in 2010, 11, 12 as probably the most expensive, unrealistic uh, experiment uh, in, in the North Sea uh, and see where we are uh, today. Um, we would have also not been earth that uh, we would have been without a vision, which is uh, to create a world that runs entirely on green energy. We would have uh, entered a massive financial crisis of the company in 2012 uh, when uh, uh, gas prices and uh, energy prices dropped. And today we know sort of uh, Europe has lived unsustainably from cheap Russian gas uh, for the last decade. Uh, and that is the problem uh, of the energy crisis we are facing uh, today. So, uh, uh, and we would of course, uh, I think, uh, not have uh, 7,000 uh, employees in the company and being a, a talent magnet uh, globally for the renewable energy industry. Um, so I think sort of when you take our journey, which started in 2008 by making a radical shift uh, from saying, uh, let's uh, uh, go from 85% conventional uh, uh, power generation uh, and 15% renewable. Let's change that. We actually thought it's going to take us uh, three decades, 30 years. That's what we thought uh, it's going to take. It took us only 10 years. And I think sort of uh, uh, that story, um, which is hopefully an inspiration uh, to not only in the energy sector, but uh, to the entire sort of uh, world of saying uh, we can be much faster in the transition. 
And, and with Earth, that uh, you basically have a blueprint um, uh, and uh, and a catalyst. That's the way we see ourselves uh, a catalyst for the industry. Um, and when you when you s just sort of see uh, uh, any scenario uh, looked at uh, in in the beginning of the year, what will happen to Europe and how will we do without Russian gas, um, which is the is the reality today. No one will have sort of uh, predicted uh, that we actually can sort of continue and the lights will not go off, uh, etc. I know we are in a crisis uh, situation, but I think we have always underestimated uh, what we can do uh, if we sort of pull our strengths together. And for me, uh, sort of the going through the pandemic and now seeing sort of the momentum we have uh, in terms of managing the actual energy crisis, if you take that momentum to the structural sort of issues we have, uh, and Henrik talked about supply chain, uh, how do we sort of build much faster, how do we allocate seabed and so on and so forth, and move away from sort of incremental thinking, how can we sort of just do the same, build more, but basically do the same uh, as we have done uh, uh, the last couple of years. If you take that momentum of a real sort of crisis thinking, and uh, you know, I'm German, uh, so if I see Germany can build LNG terminals uh, within a year, and at the same time, uh, we're discussing in Berlin uh, uh, how do we move from seven years of uh, uh, permitting an, an, onshore, an onshore wind project in Germany <coughs> to maybe five or four or three. No, we need to sort of have that same mindset mm -hmm. uh, and apply it uh, to the renewable energy build out. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that we are launching today is, as Ulrike also mentioned, is the pathway to net zero. And what I think is very important for everybody to understand here is that we are not in the report showing the technologies that are missing to connecting the dots, which actually means we have what we need, but we just don't know how to use it in the right way, to your point. And when we think about this, and coming back to your point, Peter, do you think that if all heads of state created your function, would that be the way forward? Because this is what is needing is the right policies to drive this forward, also to Martin's point. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of the solution, it's not the whole solution. I think, no, no. But, but that, I think that could be good to have a driver. I think what we see um, around the world, and we've seen that since 1990, or actually since 1988, when we got uh, the Brundtland report. Thank you for that, Norway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we've known that we have a problem and we haven't acted as a, as a planet. So yes, that's part of the solution, but I also think we need uh, something at the UN level uh, to guide the entire world. We need uh, also more action in the European Union. So, so that's also part, uh, because um, single countries will not do it alone. So that also because we have cross-border uh, movements, uh, vessels, airplanes, mm. Uh, but that's so, th so that's part of it. I, I think it's fascinating that we need, what I hear is that we need to speed up decision making, right? And that's also what we try to do. Mm -hmm. And that has to do, of course, with companies, uh, but companies are actually often rather fast compared with politicians. And that's where we have a role, right, oh. in the Danish continent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's a good point, Henrik, that it's uh, always, I think there is, and I, I was also inspired by, by what you said, Martin, and that is that actually we, we managed as a globe uh, to act rather quickly in the pandemic, COVID, right? Mm. We could use some of that decision-making power mm. also for the uh, um, green transition, mm. to put it politely. Mm. And I think we have shown that it wasn't beautiful, uh, but it was a lot of action and different countries did different things. Uh, mm. I think we, if, if we learn from that, we can speed up decision making also at the political level, but there needs to be a sense of urgency. And I think that is slowly coming. <coughs> uh, in, it's been slowly coming since 1988. Uh, so, but now I think people realize that, uh, that uh, and by people I mean politicians realize that it's actually there. And, and you can see, this summer you could start seeing some of these uh, uh, effects. And I think that is something that can spur politicians across the globe, I hope, to actually take action. So on that note, one of the things we hear a lot is what will this cost? And you saw in one of the graphs in the report that actually, if you look at how much we spend today of GDP on energy, 3.4, with the massive build-out that was shared on renewables, it will go down to 2.1. So if I was the Minister of Finance in a given country, I would say, this is really attractive, right? Hmm. So why, 
when you look also at the monetary side, and we know, and this is important to say about the ETO, we don't just talk about what the cost of technology is today, but how the cost will keep coming down for many different kinds of technologies. So to your point, uh, Hande, for instance, one of the things we are seeing is that you keep getting more technology for every dollar you invest thanks to the technology progress. Mm -hmm. So when you sit and look at your energy island build out, mm -hmm. how do you think about this? How can you scale this? And also the way, what do I pay today and what we'll pay in 10 years? Mm -hmm. It's a matter of not only looking at the short-term perspective. Mm. Because, for instance, now we are preparing the uh, energy island in the North Sea uh, to, uh, to, to um, implement 10 gigawatts of offshore wind. But we will do it in modular processes. So it will first put up three or four gigawatts, but we are preparing the electrical infrastructure, my cabling, uh, the cabling of other TSOs in Europe, to sort of uh, implement the 10 gigawatts. But who should pay for that initially? We have to have that discussion, and we can't discuss it for too long. Mm -hmm. We have to be bold and say that there is some investments that we have to do beforehand on the short term, because it will sort of make its money on the road uh, when we look further. So this, these discussions also have to be sort of uh, implemented within the whole system, that you are not only looking at the next year's finance act, you are looking at several years of investments uh, to to the families and the sons and daughters of our last panel and ours <laughs> probably also. So, so this is uh, one of the crucial keys. And maybe just for everybody to know, so what the you're looking at a budget of 30 billion euros for building the islands, so or how much are we talking about? Well, the point is that the island is not really in itself that much. It's about five or six percent of the total investment. So, I mean, we talk about the island, you can see the island, you can't see the cabling, so the island becomes interesting. But really, it's just a small part of it. The, the half, uh, half of the total investment will be the wind farms, and the rest of the bits will be the infrastructure of electrical gear. So I think we should recall what we're doing this for, and we're doing it for the offshore wind, and not only to the island. Yeah. So maybe just, so do I understand correctly that you are much more concerned about all those issues than the actual technology of making the island. So that's not your concern. Yeah, we've been looking at the whole concept of energy islands since 17. And, and in the beginning, people called it a never-never land, and it was a dream island, because it looked and sounded like something from, you know, from far out, uh, and it wasn't able to be, do, to be done. But when we looked into the several studies, we found out that there's a small part that can be done smarter with standardization, um, the interoperability of actually the HVDC cabling, which we would like the sector to, to join forces on. But all the other stuff, we have that already. We just need to do it faster and bigger. So scaling is a big one. You have a point, Peter? Yeah, I'm just, I, I think uh, energy islands are fascinating, but there's so many other things we can do in terms True. of, uh, and, and <laughs> I think the TSO Energy Net is, uh, is a crucial, um, uh, operator in that, and I, I think for the, for the rest of the grid, you, there's, you cannot only underinvest these days. So I also urge EnergyNet to to uh, be a little, little less risk averse uh, and and just get get on with it. And uh, because we can't have a grid where, where we can't connect, uh, so we have seen examples of that already. Uh, and 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 for that reason, we it's fine with any lines it's a fascinating a topic but we also have the rest of it uh, including land uh, windmills and and solar panels and all that needs to be connected and we can only underinvest so i've just urged energy net to get on with, with that part of uh, True. business too we are as well uh, good so even we can get that out today discussion is even better <laughs> martin um you run a business you have to make money on what you do when you look around in the world when you look at the opportunities ahead are there enough projects around? They're, they're not, uh, and I, it's a bit to Peter's point. Uh, you know, we need to go back to be less risk averse, making bold decisions, uh, and uh, take the big picture. I think we are fiddling way too much. And Energy Islands in Denmark is a good example. We are fiddling around uh, sort of what's the right concept, and uh, uh, Henrik mentioned it, uh, three years delay. It, it comes all too late. Um, we need to, instead of sort of trying to get it uh, precisely wrong, we need to get it roughly right and sort of directionally exactly. right, exactly the way sort of offshore wind started uh, in Denmark, you know, bold move, UK came next, uh, then came Germany, the Netherlands, a big success story. But it was not about uh, sort of, you know, fiddling around uh, a little auction frameworks and so on and so forth. What we need is uh, allocation of seabed um, at big scale, 
Scott Wind has done it in the right way. Instead of sort of keeping it artificially short uh, and trying sort of to make more money for governments uh, out of auctioning uh, auctioning Zbet, uh, they just allocated 25 gigawatt, uh, uh, and that's the that's the right way uh, to do. Then we have sort of, when we look at auction frameworks, back to the point, what is the value of power and electricity? Uh, we need to rethink that concept, uh, because no doubt uh, we brought the technology and the levelized cost of electricity. We brought down, we don't need to sort of, that's uh, that proof point, we can sort of tick mark. But we need to sort of avoid continuing on that race to the bottom, where auction frameworks are poorly sort of focusing on price and getting the price further down. LCOE, in fact, is increasing because we live in a different world uh, uh, today than uh, tw 12 or 24 months ago. We have uh, uh, inflation, uh, we have commodity prices going up, we have supply chain bottlenecks, uh, we have rising interest rates. So, of course, it goes up. But when you see it sort of relatively to mm. what is the alternative uh, on any fossil or nuclear or whatever sort of alternative is there, it's the case is a low-brainer. Mm. So what I, I think what we what we need to do is uh, and uh, you know, less focus on just price. Uh, we need to look at the value uh, mm -hmm. of of renewables, uh, and then uh, instead of uh, and I, I take in my view sort of a, a not great example um, uh, from Denmark, which is the last uh, offshore wind auction. Uh, you know, one gigawatt. Uh, you have uh, six highly qualified, reputable, uh, experienced developers and consortiums sort of running running for that. Um, Everyone willing. Uh, there was a concession element, not good concession, not good. Uh, and I'll explain why. Uh, because uh, if we need to pay for seabed or to build the project, uh, many of 100 million euros or whatever, uh, dollar or whatsoever, that money is missed uh, for innovation and uh, for paying uh, Henrik to uh, ramp up the supply chain. I cannot sort of pay for the seabed and then <laughs> I, I pay for ramping up capacity. <laughs> so uh, I think the, uh, the uh, and then what is the outcome? Uh, the outcome is that uh, f five of the six uh, basically uh, gather in a room uh, and uh, draw a lottery ticket uh, who can actually build the project instead of sort of saying, why are you not allocating five times one gigawatt and have, uh, have the projects being built out? Because I think what we also need to be clear is uh, we look at the capacity in Europe. Uh, there's going to be a, there's going to be a, a, a race uh, right. across markets and countries uh, in Europe, in APEC, in North America. Who's going to actually have uh, have the capacity to build out? Thank you for that, Martin. We are coming uh, we're coming to the end, and uh, and I think one of the very critical points is really, as I said, we actually have what we need. It's all about how do we scale it. But maybe I would like to ask the last question: Is are we measuring the right things? So as an example, if you look at now, we talked, for instance, as far as I know, there's 165 gigawatts of offshore wind agreed in Europe to be installed before 2030. At the same time, we know if we're going to get to Paris, we have to cut the CO2 emissions 8% every year. Now, during the pandemic, we cut them 6% when we were not flying, we were not sitting at home. We can only do that once. Uh, so that we can do one year, but then the next year, what do we then do? So if we change what we measure in terms of getting to Paris, would that be the answer? And if so, what should we measure? And that's a question to all three of you, starting with you, Peter. I love that question, and there are many ways you could uh, answer that. Let me uh, do it in a way you don't expect, I think. And that okay. is, I think you are doing a great job, <laughs> and it has a lot to do with energy here, right? But we also have an agricultural sector. Uh, and that agricultural sector uh, emits a lot of methane. Methane is a more powerful um, greenhouse gas than, than uh, CO2, uh, uh, in, in the sense that it, it really uh, contributes a lot to, to global warming in the short run. So one of the things, and that's one of the purposes of the Danish Council on Climate Change, is that we think of the whole system. And there you, you, um, you have relatively few solutions. I think in the energy sector, there are some. But we also have to think about methane and the agricultural sector, and that's uh, maybe the biggest headache when we come to 2030. Let me, so, I, I could, I yeah, could, yeah, I'm sure you could elaborate. Yeah. So, so, but it's really about, so we should measure the totality, and we should not admit gigawatt, which is always what we talk about. We need to measure something else I as well. I think we, sh we should, what we should And the value to society. What we should measure is uh, reductions of CO2 emissions, uh, equivalent, CO2 equivalent emissions. That would be the right thing to measure. That's what that was matter, matters for the global warming. So that would be a start. Uh, and, and then, of course, I actually think that there's nuance. So CO2 equivalents uh, hide the fact that methane 
laughter gas and, and uh, CO2 are not equally potent in the short run, and that's something we also need to, uh, to think about. And, and that may be not so much for this crowd. I know this uh, is an odd comment made, <laughs> but, but it is one that matters for, for the climate, and, sure. and, and so for that reason, it's important. Thanks, Peter. Heine, what should we measure? I think we should measure less, actually, and just do things, <laughs> basically, okay. uh, which I, I think covers also what my colleagues here say, uh, because we cannot calculate and anticipate everything. We just have to do things uh, and change uh, how we've done it until now. Thank you. I very much uh, agree with that uh, with that comment from, from Anna. Uh, I think we have a translation issue. Uh, I think we measure the right things, uh, but translating sort of, uh, we, we now translate uh, how much renewable, whatever technology, we need to build uh, by when in order sort of to achieve. Uh, what we are not doing is, what does it take uh, from today and tomorrow to actually get there? Uh, and that's also what politicians are not focusing on. Uh, everyone focuses on ambitions uh, in 10 years' time. Um, but exactly sort of what it takes uh, to get there, and where I think we sort of have a huge execution issue uh, on the whole renewable uh, transition. And uh, I, I loved uh, the, the back end of the, of the panel uh, when you talked about your children um, and you know, why is this important. And I think everyone can relate to that. I have a 12-year-old daughter. When I tried to explain to her sort of, you know, a couple of years ago why, why am I spending and why am I uh, uh, you know, fascinated about working in, uh, in renewable energy uh, and told her sort of, uh, what I hope sort of, uh, I can play a role in uh, is to avoid uh, that she is facing when she's uh, in my age, uh, all the climate uh, scenarios we're actually facing today. And she are asking me this summer when no water in the Rhine and the Po uh, and in the, in the Loire, uh, you know, she's asking me, didn't you sort of say uh, that was uh, what you wanted to prevent in 30 years time? <laughs> so uh, you know, we, we, we need to act. Uh, that's, yeah. that's Thank you. Part. We've come to, uh, to the end. Um, so let me just say, I think the takeaway from our short discussion here is that number one, we have uh, what we need. We need to take significantly more action. Mindset here is probably critically important and that we actually should be much bolder. And maybe I think it's also showing us that not by being bold is probably the boldest thing we can do because then we will gamble the whole farm. Thank you so much and please uh, thank the panelists. And now we will hear what's gonna happen in Egypt on COP27. Dr. Mahmoud Mohildin. Thank you very much for joining us. It is a pleasure that you're able to share some insights with us here today. It is only a few weeks until all eyes will be on Sharm el Sheikh for COP27. You're an economist with more than 30 years of experience in international finance and development, and you are a professor for economics and finance at Cairo University. You're also the UN climate change high level champion for Egypt. What impact do you expect the renewed short-term focus on energy security will have on COP27 negotiations? This question was the subject of an important uh, publication that uh, we led as uh, champions with the International Energy Agency, IEA, with the Renewable uh, Energy Agency, um, IRENA, and uh, the UK Department for Business, um, in addition to energy and industrial a strategy um, that we produce through this collaboration, um, a report on the uh, breakthrough agenda focusing on energy and the prospects of uh, energy going forward. Um, my reading of this report that we are seeing uh, two, um, uh, two waves. The first wave is a kind of a short uh, term and, and, and I hope short lived as well kind of a super pragmatic approach to energy, um, uh, focusing on uh, energy security regardless of the source, including fossil fuel, as we had seen recently in Europe and other countries. Uh, this is uh, basically because of the necessity of the need, uh, not out of uh, love to do uh, more damage to, the cl uh, to climate, but basically trying to uh, fix the problems of today by securing the essential, including from uh, natural gas. This is definitely a setback to the climate action agenda that uh, pushes for more reliance on uh, renewable energy. 
But uh, despite the huge investment that happened during the last few years, uh, the investments in renewable energy are not sufficient enough to um, um, uh, provide the access and the needed energy for uh, many countries, including in Europe. So this is understandable. And we're, uh, but at the same time, this kind of a shock and threat had produced um, a very important mid-term to long-term uh, ambition to diversify the sources of energy, not just geographically, not to be heavily dependent on one source, but actually to diversify the different kinds of energy, including from wind, solar, and the new rising star in the area of energy, uh, the clean green uh, hydrogen um, as, as a source. I'm, I'm referring to a very important statement made by uh, the European Commissioner, Mr. Timmerman, that uh, he said that uh, Europe will not be self-sufficient on green hydrogen as well, and he's seeking realistically so partnership. Good thing, good news is that uh, the neighborhood of uh, Europe, uh, the Southern Mediterranean countries and the African countries are ready with solutions, uh, opportunities and comparative advantage in producing clean green um, hydrogen is there for countries like Egypt, uh, Morocco, uh, Namibia, and uh, many other countries. Um, and I think there is a coalition of, um, of a number of African countries pushing for this kind of an approach as a good investable area uh, for finance and uh, partnership. I hope as well that part of the 600 billion that had been promised by the G7 in their uh, latest meeting, part of that will be directed to this area of work on renewables, including in uh, green hydrogen. A country like Egypt, the host of COP27, last time I checked, I think they have a close of uh, 15 uh, MOUs uh, for producing uh, green hydrogen. What is needed for uh, many of these MOUs, some of them do have it, but others uh, are in need for support, um, is basically to have binding uh, agreement, uh, offtake agreements. But the consortiums are, are ready, so the supply side is ready, but definitely the demand side needs to be more articulated. Uh, we have seen some good developments, including from the shipment industry, um, um, again, coming from the Nordic countries, but uh, there are other uh, opportunities uh, with this kind of partnership in the region and in Europe that could benefit definitely from the huge uh, investments uh, in uh, green hydrogen. It's a, it's a big a promising sector that has uh, many interesting developments as well um, that could remind us again of the holistic approach because it is basically about the impact on uh, the investment in human capital because you need uh, better skills or different skills rather in order to deal with this new source of energy. Many households around the world are dealing with a cost of living crisis. How do the priorities of COP27 fit in with their everyday challenges? Right, I think um, th this very important question that coming from you, it was raised to me um, from um, a fellow villager from Egypt uh, when my an announcement as a champion or a coordinator of the non-state actors uh, was made. And he said, well, congratulations, but what's in it for us? Which is very legitimate, very simple, very straightforward question. Uh, how the climate action agenda, how this global event, how this big summit that will have leaders, um, uh, politicians, uh, CEOs, uh, um, uh, community uh, activists, and, um, and the likes are going to be providing solutions to um, the ordinary person in the street. If this um, uh, COP to be successful, it needs to address matters related to the, uh, uh, the issues of tomorrow, which is basically about the, the future of this world and the challenges that we have for climate action and how to keep the 1.5 centigrade um, alive um, uh, as, a, as a target and how to uh, fulfill the Paris Agreement and put us in, in the right trajectory um, uh, uh, to, towards 2030 and beyond when it comes to the, the reduction of emission. So far, we're not doing a very good job in that. And I think the actions in, 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 in Sharm Sheikh will help putting us back on this track. But at the same time, we shouldn't be forgetting, as you mentioned in your second question, that there is an energy security crisis that needs to be dealt with, that there is a food crisis 
actually in terms of price and availability in many of the countries that need to be dealt with. And a third uh, challenge in addition to food and energy, that the sources of finance in dealing with these problems are still very much dependent on debt and we are living through a wave of debt challenges around the world. So I'm happy to see that the agenda and the thematic days are addressing these issues from finance to issues related to food security, uh, solutions in the short term, mid term, long term to, to energy. Um, we, you are in Africa hosting the COP, so issues related to agriculture, food system adaptation, water management is going to be in the forefront of the implementation uh, agenda. So I'm happy that this um, uh, rich agenda prepared for you in COP while is dealing with the midterm, long-term challenges of climate, and actually many of the problems of climate, we're feeling it today. Um, the, the extreme weather changes that have been impacting the, uh, the US a um, uh, few, uh, few weeks ago, um, uh, the, the floods affecting Pakistan, uh, the problems of the deforestation um, and, and floods as well at the same time happening um, uh, in, in Africa. All of that from the present and far danger we need really to have this kind of huge investment directed, and that could really provide uh, hope, uh, not dealing just with the climate action and the ultimate crisis facing us, but at the same time, dealing with other crises of the day that resulted post COVID-19 and because of the war in the Ukraine. Thank you very much for your time today and best of luck for a successful COP27 in Sharm el -Shaik. So let me wrap up this morning. Uh, the morning is coming to an end. I've got also three takeaways. We've learned that uh, for the first time, we're exp expecting more than 50% of the energy mix to be uh, green, but we're still heading towards a 2.2 future. And our, our first panel was even a little bit more pessimistic in that, that uh, area. Both panels showed that there are plenty of opportunities, both on the technology side and on the investment side. Um, and the third one, we were really inspired by the Danish case, both on governmental and on business level. Uh, I have a fourth one as well, uh, and that's that our children won't forget us if we don't take bold decisions now. We hope that our findings and the perspectives um, have I need to check if the mic works because I'm just, let me take the rest from here. Did it work? Sorry, okay. <laughs> um, we hope that our findings and the perspectives of our speakers have given you new insights and that our research of, and, and, and the data will help you to, on your journey to a net zero future. You will receive an email with a download to both an executive summary and the full report. I would like to thank our joiners online for joining us today. Thank you. And then I think we're without the virtual <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> and for those for those